I see it. Okay, well, we're going to start with uh, Amazing Grace today, okay? You saw it on Facebook? You do see it? My phone still doesn't like Facebook, I think. <laughs>
Okay, let's open with a word of prayer today. Our gracious God and our Father, we are so thankful for your grace, your amazing grace that sent your Son into this world to pay a penalty that he did not owe. He allowed himself to be nailed to a cross where he bled, died, was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures and today by simple faith in the finished work of that cross we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of thy grace. We're so thankful that today, Lord, we stand in the grace of God, that it's not our works, but entirely of thee. I thank you for those that have gathered here today. I thank you for those that are joining us by way of internet. I pray this will be a time of blessing, a time of edification, a time of education in the word of God. Pray for my wife, Lord, this morning, who did not have a great night last night. Pray for your grace, pray for your mercy upon her in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's do the, let's say hello this morning. Okay. We got John and Cindy Linquist from Alaska. You think it's cold here? Richard and Deb from Whitehead, Idaho. This is Deb from Idaho, by the way, right there. And Ron and Pam Krugman, Loveland, Colorado. Scott and Debbie from Longmont, Colorado. Good morning. Bud and Rhonda from Gillette, Wyoming. The Beldings from Wyoming. The LeBrakes from Tyndale, South Dakota. Diane from uh, who now Ogden, uh, Utah. The Ellsburns from Ohio. The Rightly Dividing Guys from Illinois. Uh, Vernell and Donna from Sun City, Arizona. And the Rodellas from Reducio, New Mexico. The Rhett Webbers from Rockwell, Texas. Uh, Teresa Gibson and daughters and son there, uh, the grandson there. And Francis, Rivers Francis from Texas. The Herring family, but now we got Josh and Elizabeth right here from uh, Rock, Round Rock, Texas. Good morning. Lily from Orlando. The Crespos from Fo Fort Walton Beach, Florida. Uh, Larry and Janice from Alabama, Larry and Mary Tidwell from Birmingham, Alabama, uh, Regina Bradford and the, the, the Keats here from Arkansas, Mama Joy from uh, Athens, Alabama, Maraby, North Carolina, the Campbells from Palm Beach, Orlando and Poppy and the Sheep from Bald Spa, New York, Jamie and her sister Sandy from Ohio, good morning. Margaret from St. Paul, Minnesota. The Edwards from Lancaster, Ohio. The Weavers from Wimber, Pennsylvania. The Gaffneys from Pennsylvania. Lynn Berkebile and her mother from Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Uh, from New York, Jean Rossi. Uh, Johnny and Christine Angel, Crossville, Tennessee. The Dolzar from New Jersey. Joe and Sherry Mason. Uh, he's a dentist, by the way from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And then our very own Christy, Donna Gilmain, Portland, Maine, Flo uh, I was gonna say Portland, Maine, Florida. I don't think they have anything in common right now. But from Portland, Maine. Maureen from Bethel, Connecticut. Rita, not here today, okay. Good morning, Rita. James and James. Rosario de Perry, Woodbridge, New Jersey. Good morning. Frank Verderosa and our mother, Jeanette Verderosa. Good morning, folks. Fred and Nancy Housiel and uh, Josh. Good morning. Uh, Lori and Ken James, uh, Smith Grove, Kentucky. Brent and Doris uh, Brady from Virginia, who are now in Honduras. The South American group, right here. Uh, uh, Suriname, South America, Michelle Harewood, uh, the Goosens from South Africa, Bev McLeod, Alberta, Canada, good morning. <coughs> Rock Burbe 
from Masouche, Quebec. I had a talk with him yesterday on FaceTime, well, not FaceTime, but a video chat with him. And uh, there's a lot of people who are really, 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 really enjoying this last series of messages that I'm doing. A lot, a lot, a lot of people. And from Bangalore, India, Anand Bindu and two sons, Solomon Chitra Jude. Good morning from Bangalore, the Mortley family. Uh, Joy Tasker uh, and her mom Gwen from uh, England. And Francois from France and Miley from Panama. And if I miss someone, consider yourselves to have been said hello to. And we got a family, you're no longer visitors anymore, so I can't recognize you as visitors because you've been here before. So that ends that. And I see, uh, which, which one's Austin? You? Which one's, is there an Austin? Asher, Asher. Who, Asher on that side? And Everest, Asher and Everest, yeah. And Asher's the one without the halo, right? Or is that Everest? Which one? Oh, that was Everest. Oh, okay. Okay. Sal? Well, it's good, to f it's good to see you folks. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning to you online and Facebook. And let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his love toward us that he showed on the cross. Fathers, we continue to hear these messages that you increase our faith, and faith cometh by hearing, hearing the word of God. We thank you for our pastor, Lord. Bless him, lead God, and direct him. Father, as we collect the collection, we pray that you bless the gift and the giver. And in Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks. Amen. Amen. Well, folks, uh, you, how many of you remember Jimmy Pittman? You, m you remember Jimmy Pittman, the guy who quoted the Bible. We put up the whole Paul's, uh, Paul in a, cell, in a jail cell. Yeah, I, well, we've been talking, and he, I've invited him to come back when this COVID thing is over. Obviously, he can't come now with all the hassles, but... He dresses like the Apostle Paul, and he just quotes scriptures forever. I mean, I think the guy knows almost all of Paul's epistles by memory now. And he's going to be singing live tonight on Facebook, for those of you who are interested. Our brother Jimmy Pittman. Turn my I finally got my phone to work. I was hitting the wrong button in Facebook. Us old people, man, you know, it done. it's not like uh, I should have had uh, Asher come up here and show me how to work this thing. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> okay, let's do one eye survey.
working. Somehow, yeah. Then you've got power. This is plugged in over under there. Oh, it's plugged in under there. Yeah. Okay. But this is plugged in over here. How could it be working? It's not. Your microphone's not working. I got microphone oh. cells and. Well, we got to find a different. Ah, he just hit the breaker. Yeah. He just hit the breaker. Yeah. That's why I plugged in the separate thing over there. Uh, I can plug this. So we have all every heater going, right? <laughs> that one's working. You're still working. You guys got a heater over there too? Yeah. It's off now. You turned it off, okay. <laughs> Sound just came back, okay. Sound just came back. You got all plugged in, your laptop, uh, everything's, you're kidding. The only thing that went was my mic. Wow. Better now. Okay, so it looks like everybody's getting sound. Thank you, uh, Nathan. He knows where the breakers are. <laughs> Which is not an easy task because I don't think any of us knew where they were for 15 years. Wow. You sure you're all set? Looks like everything's okay. Amen. Okay. Yeah, we have to have eaters in here. I know. Pretty bad. <laughs> no, I know where they are now, too. I was on my way there last week, and he was, he was there, too, because he had spotted them. That was interesting. So I think everything's going okay. Houston? Lift off, right? All right. All right, well, this is the first message of 2021. 2021 has been an interesting year, to say the least. I mean, 2020. 2021 hasn't happened yet. I'm sure it will prove to be interesting also. 2020 has been the year of fear, a lot of fear, a lot of, you know what fear is, right? False evidence appearing real. That's what fear really is. But there's been a lot of fear from the events that have been unfolding around us. And I'm going to talk about fear today somewhat. But I'm not going to talk about the fear that the world is fearful of. I want to talk about a fear that is real in the hearts of many believers. A fear that has been promoted by pastors all across the spectrum of Christendom. And it's less severe for some. It's more intense for others. For some of us, it's non-existent whatsoever. Over the last two months, I have received literally hundreds of testimonies, hundreds, from all over the world of people who are so appreciative that someone finally said what they had been thinking but never dared to say because they feared retribution. They feared to be labeled as heretics and now people are coming out of the woodwork and are saying brother rodney what you have been saying has set us free and i'm going to share today again some of the truths that are so real for me now in my understanding of the word of god but a lot of people who sat under what, what can only be labeled now as fear, fear. It's, it's a fear preaching, although some now are, are minimizing. They're minimizing what they've been saying. 
and they're turning it into something different than what the Bible teaches it is. But some people felt, you know, all I have is Christ, that's all I have. And they didn't feel it was enough based on, because we all came out of churches where there were things that were placed on us outside of faith in Christ. There's requirements placed on people. And people had been convinced that they had to render God service that somehow would be calculated and converted into a heavenly currency of gold, silver, precious stones, or God forbid, wood, hay, stubble. And the very thought of having been saved by grace through faith and now realizing that after their salvation, their work for the Lord, their service for the Lord would now be tried by fire. And it did not line up with what they knew in their heart that they have in Christ. I mean, after all, am I not complete in Christ? Did not Jesus Christ do everything? Did he not pay for everything? And there's nothing that I can render unto him to pay him back for that? What can I do for someone who has done everything for me, for someone who gave his all for me. What could I do in comparison with that? I mean, these are some of the things that people have written to me about, the concerns of their hearts. It's been amazing to me. I mean, it has been truly amazing to me. You know, when... I was in my denominational church. I was constantly placed under a performance-based program. Always. We all were. And there was always something that was placed on me that I had to do. And I never felt in my heart that I could measure up to assert that kind of a standard. That's the kind of testimony I'm hearing from people. It was always this level of performance and this level of work that I had to measure up to, and I never felt adequate enough to do it. I always felt inadequate. I never felt I had the gold, silver, precious stones that they were talking about. This is the testimony of hundreds of people that are writing me now from every country in the world, from Germany, from Russia, from Switzerland, from... Italy, from Spain, who are so thankful that I said something about the judgment seat of Christ. So I want to paint a picture for you today. Part of what I'm going to say is true. Part of what I'm going to say is illustrative. Is your mother with you? Oh, okay. I was going to say close the door. <laughs> um, you know, how many of you used to go to your grandparents' house when you were growing up with your cousins? You'd meet your cousins, right? I'm going to tell you a story, okay? I don't know how well you can see this in here. Sal, turn the light off just for a second, please. Turn these lights off here. I, I want to show you this, okay? Come on. Get moving. Maybe it'll come a little clearer. Yeah, okay. Okay. So this is, this is the house where my mother was born. This is our grandparents' house. There was 13 kids there in that house, 13. And then as they started growing up, they started building their houses down on this road. This is called Canada Road right here. This is in uh, St. Jock, New Brunswick. And as they, the 13 kids, some of them moved out. Some of them moved to Montreal. Some of them moved to Quebec. Okay, but as I was growing up, like even this house here, you see that trail that goes up there? Everybody, everybody from down here, that, that was, they went up to, this was called Sakot on the hill. Okay, and every year, 
every year, us kids, their age, their age, we would be here, and every summer, we would be waiting for our cousins from Montreal and from Quebec to arrive. There was like 70, 80 of us, the cousins, all the kids, right? And we were waiting for all our cousins to arrive, and then this barn, this barn was filled with hay. And there was rafters in that barn. And we used to jump off the rafters into the hay. And you want to talk about a good time. Okay, Sal. You want to talk about a good time. Being with all the cousins and all the family and corn boils and all the things that they made. I mean, this whole field, we were all there. It was the greatest times ever, 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 ever in our lives. And what I'm sharing is true of whether you're from Poland or Germany or France or Spain or Italy. This is true in every single country in the world, in every city, in every hamlet in the world. When you got together with your cousins, it was amazing. Am I right? I'm right, right? Well, just imagine, and I'm certain everyone, like I'm saying, can relate to this in one way or another. So here we all are. We're all gathered together. All family. All fun. All Gentiles. All religious. All heathen. That's what the Bible called us. Heathen. We had heard about God, but this is where it goes into an illustration, okay? <laughs> we had heard about God, but He was the God of the Jews that kept us at arm's length for thousands of years. So we just minded our business, especially since they called us all dogs. We knew they didn't like us. We did hear through the grapevine, though, that... Uh, Something had happened to one of them. Something on a, some guy was blinded, saw a light from heaven. We didn't pay too much attention to it. It's another one of their little fables that they had. But that was a couple years ago, and we didn't hear anything about that pretty much ever again. So here we all are one day. The whole family. Hundreds of us. Sakot on the hill. And all of a sudden, a couple of guys show up. And they get our attention. And of course, all the kids, all the uncles, all the aunts, they all want to know what they're going to say. Because they're from those Jews over there. And they come and they tell us, they start telling us that they have a message from God for us, us Gentiles. They want to tell us that there's a message from God about a free gift that God wants to give us. That we don't have to do anything for it. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. We can't even pay for it. That there's nothing we can do because it was paid for by someone else. And they tell us there's this Savior who came and died for them. But the leaders of our nation, they said, rejected him. And so now he's turning to you. And he wants us to tell you about this free gift because he died and he shed his blood and he was buried and he rose again the third day 
according to the scriptures. And now all you have to do is believe. And he will save you by grace through faith. Well, my grandfather is interested because they've got all of our attention now and we all want to know. So grandpa says, okay, so what do we have to do? Nothing. Just believe. Just believe? That's it? Yeah. And what will happen to us? You'll be forgiven of all the sins you've ever committed and you'll receive the free gift of eternal life. And who told you to tell us this? God. God told you to come tell us Gentiles this? Yes. That sounds too good to be true. Nothing is free. But it is true. It's all by faith. You're telling me that we don't have to do anything? Nothing? And it's a free gift? Yes, absolutely. You don't have to do anything. Grandpa looks around. Hey, what do you think? We think it's a good deal, Grandpa. We think it's a good deal. Everybody? Everybody, okay? Okay. We'll take it. And then all of a sudden, Everyone is happy. Everyone is rejoicing. Their sins are forgiven. <laughs> Grandpa says, hey, hey, Mama, I think I feel less burden on my shoulder. You? Yeah, I feel good. And everybody's dancing and singing. We're saved. We have eternal life. And we didn't have to do anything for it, Grandpa. And just as the two Jews are getting to walk away, they hold up their Columbo finger and they say, uh, just one more small thing. Just one more small thing. Your service to the Lord, it will be judged. So what you'll want to do is you'll want to accumulate some gold, silver, precious stones that can be converted into the heavenly currency of heaven. So when you can get there, you can get some real good rewards. What did you say? What did you just say? Uh, yeah, sir. Your service, your service to the Lord is going to be tried by fire. Oh, really? Your service is going to be tried by fire? Really? Why, you lying, dirty, little scoundrel. I knew it was too good to be true. I knew there was a catch. Now you take your scrawny little behind and you hightail it off my property right now. Do you hear me? You realize, ladies and gentlemen, that a gospel that mixes works of any kind is not a gospel at all. You know that that is no longer good news in any way, shape, or form. 
So here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to do. When you share the gospel, if you're going to be honest, if you're going to be honest, full disclosure, full disclosure, if you really believe that you're going to a judgment seat of Christ where your works are going to be tried by fire after you've been saved by grace through faith, if you're going to be honest, then when you share the gospel, when you witness to people, when you preachers, when you preach to people, you need to tell them the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. You tell them, oh yeah, you escaped the big one. Yeah, you escaped the great white throne judgment. You tell them that. But then you also tell them, but there's one more judgment for you to go to. You tell them the truth if that's what you believe. Because if you don't tell them the truth, you're not being honest. You're not being honest with them. People come into this thing called Christianity by grace, through faith, promised there's nothing you have to do. It's a free gift. You can't earn it. You can't pay for it. You don't deserve it. And then a year later, two years later, they hear somebody talk about the judgment seat of Christ. They go, what, what, what? Why didn't you tell me that in the beginning? Maybe I wouldn't have accepted your free gift if I knew that my works and my service were going to be tried by fire. Many people feel they've been lied to by preachers in Christendom. You escape the great white throne judgment. But there's still one more to go. And guess who's not happy? My family's not happy with that. And I'm not happy with that. And if you're happy with that, you don't know the Word of God. And you don't know what Jesus Christ did for you. You don't know who you are. Every man's work, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it. You really believe that that day is the rapture? You really believe that? Do you really believe, oops, do you really believe that because it shall be revealed by fire, Fire is judgment. Fire is judgment. You believe that's the rapture? And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is? This is not talking about a believer's service. This has been reduced to that. But notice what this says. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any, man shall, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Yet he himself shall be saved. Yet so as by fire. I got news for you. I'm not saved by fire. I'm saved by grace. I'm not saved by fire and you're not saved by fire, and you will never be saved by fire, and those who tell you that you're saved by fire, no, no. You're not saved by fire. And this is not talking about your service. Know ye not 
that ye are the temple of God. I got news for you. You are not the temple of God. You are the body of Christ. And if you confuse the two, again, you don't know who you are. And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Not his works, not his service. Him shall God destroy. You should be glad you're not the temple of God, that you are the body of Christ. They're not interchangeable. They're not interchangeable. Unless you spiritualize this, like many people are doing now, they want to spiritualize the Bible. Is that what you want to do? Spiritualize the Word of God? Is that what you want to do? Not, never going to happen in this pulpit. I promise you that. It's never going to happen in this pulpit. We spiritualize when it says like as or like unto. That's when you spiritualize. When you're told to spiritualize. Not when something is written literally. Some of you came here because you wanted the King James Bible. Here's the King James Bible. This has been watered down by so many preachers, preachers that it's, it's a shame. It's a shame what has been done to this. If you're going to preach this, preach it the way it is. You tell people that you've talked about grace and you tell them if you destroy this temple, him will, God will destroy you. You tell them the truth. You don't lie to them and turn this into something that it's not. Your service for the Lord. There's not even a verse in Paul's epistles that talks about your service to the Lord. Not one. But members of the body of Christ have found it. Grace preachers have found it. But it's not there. And it's imposed into the Word of God. I've had people telling me now that, oh, the judgment seat of Christ is a place of comfort and a place of joy. No, it's not. It is not a place of comfort and it is not a place of joy. Yeah, peace and joy. Yeah, really? Just this past Friday night, a man told me literally what I'm going to tell you right now. Matter of fact, I'll even tell you who it is. His name is Jeff. He's the admin on our YouTube channel. And don't mess with him because he's six foot two. And he's a big dude. And he has my permission and my authority to get rid of all you troublemakers. Like instantaneously with no questions asked because I'm sick and tired of a lot of things that are going on. But he told me this on Friday. He said, the church I used to go to, my pastor used to always read this, Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Ye that work iniquity. He said to me, look at all the things in verse 22 that these people have done. I mean, talk about service to the Lord. Prophesying. Casting out devils. Many wonderful works. And if they did all of that, and the Lord said to them, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. What in the world is he going to say to me? I can't match what these people have done. What is he going to say to me? He told me that Friday. He's watching right now. And that man is thrilled to know. And he's glad that he has finally learned that his relationship with Jesus Christ is not based on fear, 
but on hope, love, grace, and forgiveness. And it's not based on works of any kind. Not to get the salvation, not to keep the salvation, and not to be rewarded for anything you've done in your salvation. This is a grace relationship. There are some people who think this is a good and happy event to look forward to. Especially those who are yelling at each other right now online and calling each other names. Judging each other and blocking each other and basically acting like any worldling would act. Like any baby who gets something taken away from them would act. And they want to go to this event with that kind of service to the Lord. That's what they're rendering to the Lord right now. People have been saying, oh yeah, that they're going to the judgment seat of Christ. I said, you're not going to the judgment seat of Christ. And many people are now acting like they don't really believe what they say about the judgment seat of Christ because they can't possibly believe that and be acting the way they're acting. It's not possible can't believe you're going through a judgment seat of Christ acting like you are. I don't, I don't think it's possible. I hear things I, I disagree from people all the time. I don't prance around the internet judging them and wanting to, and calling them names and I don't do that. You see, I'm, I'm in grace and you know what I believe? I believe to let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I will let you do that. That's grace. Don't tell me you know grace. Don't tell me you understand grace. If you can't let someone see what they see in the Word of God and give them the grace to just see it that way, don't tell me you know grace. I've never seen so much hypocrisy in my life as I've seen in the grace movement in the past two months, ever in my life. Not in any denominational church did I ever see or witness hypocrisy like I've seen it now, and hatred, hatred. I've never seen hatred like I have seen it now from people who claim to be grace believers. You're nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. And I'm not afraid to tell you. And I mean, you want to know the truth personally? If you think you're going to the judgment seat of Christ, you're free to, you're free to believe that. I, I don't care if that's what you believe. You're, enti you're, you're entitled to that. But guess what? I don't see that a member of the body of Christ is going to a judgment seat of Christ. And I'm going to show you more of it today, but... I don't see it. So you're just going to have to get over it. Or you can go f listen to someone else. I mean, that's up to you, you know. Because I'm not going to change my mind on that today. Tomorrow is not looking good either. Because I know what I believe about the Word of God. So let me ask you this. Can you prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that the day in this verse is the rapture. Can you prove that? Let me ask you this. Do you think this day, Romans 2.16, do you think this day, in the day, when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, do you think that is the rapture? Because that day belongs in the same context as 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Did you know that the entirety of Romans chapter 2 is about the judgment of God? Literally, the judgment of God? It begins this way, Romans 2, 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth, not like your judgment, not like the judgment of man. The judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. 
And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? I think anybody here could really understand this is talking about the judgment, like the big one, right? As we can continue down this chapter, Paul follows the same line of reasoning. Look at verse 12. For as many as have sinned without law shall perish also without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. Then we find ourselves at verse 16. In the day, oh, in the day when God shall judge. The whole context is the great white throne judgment. Now we get here all of a sudden, this is the rapture. Okay. What kind of Bible exposit expository teaching is that? Context, 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 right? So I ask you again, are you absolutely certain that this day is the rapture? Many of you believe that. But are you certain? Are you positive? Because what I'd like to encourage you to do is keep in mind, keep in view the context. Context is very important. Okay, I will tell you this. This is not the rapture when God judges the secrets of men. The context doesn't bear it. The doctrine doesn't bear it. Let me put these two verses on the board. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it. Romans 2.16, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men. Are you absolutely certain these two verses are the rapture? If you are, you believe there's fire at the rapture? You believe there's fire at the rapture? And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory? You think there's rapture there? I mean, you think there's fire there? Within the context of the transition epistles that these verses were written at around Acts 18 and Acts chapter 20, especially 1 Corinthians 3.13 and Romans 2.16, definitely works, definitely tried by fire. But who are they? Who are those people? Let me give you a hint. It's the two guys that came to my grandfather's house. They're teachers of the Gentiles. That's also Romans chapter 2. They're teachers of the Gentiles. And they will be judged. Their works will be tried by fire. Because there's a way to reach Gentiles in those days. Let me share something else with you, okay? You remember this? Matthew 24, 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. We know that this is the doctrine for the little flock, right? Going through the tribulation period. You recognize it, right? Right? Matthew 10, 22. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Let's confirm that verse with Mark 13, 13. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Do you see anything consistent with these verses? The doctrine of unto the end. Definitely not a doctrine for the body of Christ, right? Hebrews 3, 6. But Christ as a son over his own house... Whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence of rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end? Little flock. Hebrews to Revelation. After the rapture of the church, written to Israel going through the tribulation period, right? Hebrews 3.14. For we are made partakers of Christ if, if, we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. 
Revelation 2.26, He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Can you see something consistent in these verses? For the little flock going through the tribulation period. They have to endure to the end. And by the way, verse 26, power over the nations, as in positions of authority and ruling. Why do they get these positions of authority and ruling? Because they overcame. Because they suffered. Because they endured unto the end of the tribulation period. They overcame they earned their positions, just like we've been looking al all along in the last 10 messages. It's obvious that there are people, the little flock, who have to endure to the end. Is that obvious to everyone? Yes? No? Kind of? No? Nah. No? Kathy, no? Yeah? Yeah? Do you have to endure to the end? Huh? Okay. Based on the fact that you are sealed unto the day of redemption, the apostle to the Gentiles never told a member of the body of Christ that you have to endure unto the end. Told you just the opposite. Romans 8, 38, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing can ever separate you. You don't have to endure. You can, you'll be discouraged at times in your life. You, you'll, you'll go through times when you'll, you, won't, you won't feel you're saved. You'll go through times when you, 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 the, seal, the, the, the heavens are brass. You'll, go, you'll experience all those things that cause you to be discouraged. And, but you're going to be saved. Why? You're sealed. You're in Christ. You're in Christ. That's because our salvation is not based on works, but it's based on what Jesus Christ has done for us. Isn't that a blessing to know? Isn't that comforting to know that you were not saved by works and that it's not works or your service that enables you to continue and finish this, the course of your journey? What a difference between their program of fear and our program of grace and peace. Amen? Now let's look at these two verses again. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, I ask if people are certain that these verses have to do with the rapture. Let me show you a verse that comes right before this, not long before 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, notice the apostle said to these people, he's writing to the church of God which he persecuted, who shall confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, based on what we've just gone through, who is the doctrine of continuing unto the end for? The little flock, the little flock, the church of God that Paul persecuted. Here's people that will be confirmed unto the end. You're not confirmed unto the end. You're sealed until the day of redemption. Okay, I was confirmed when I was a kid. You're sealed unto the day of redemption. 
And do you as members of the body of Christ need to be confirmed unto the end? In light of that truth, can you absolutely say that the day of the Lord Jesus Christ is the rapture? Based on everything we just looked at. I'm, I'm talking now, now I'm talking only to people who believe the King James Bible. I'm talking to people who know that every word of God is pure. That God's language is not confused. That God doesn't use slang. That when he speaks to a certain group of people, there is a language that he uses for those people. And there is a sealed language. A language of grace that he speaks to a group of people called the body of Christ. There is a day that's associated with those who have to endure unto the end. There's a day for that. It's called the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. I do believe that everyone understands that the second coming of Jesus Christ is called the revelation of Jesus Christ, right? That's what the book of the Revelation is all about. It's about Jesus Christ returning at the end of that time period, right? I remember when I was beginning to see the Word of God rightly divided, and I was noticing that not everything in the Bible was written to me. That was a great help. You guys remember when, that started, when you started seeing right division and things just cleared up for you. And as I was reading, I was the adult Sunday school teacher at the, the church on the hill. And I, ran the, I read this verse one night, 1 Peter 1.13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I'll always remember the night that I was reading this verse and my glasses almost fell off my face and my jaw dropped and I said, oh my, Peter's talking to people who are alive at the second coming of Jesus Christ. I've been gone for seven years. Peter's not talking to me. Poof. I'll never forget that day when that happened in that verse that night. I remember where I was sitting. I remember the lighting in my office. It was the first time I knew and finally understood not everything in this book is written to me as a member of the body of Christ. So, you see the verse here? Hope unto the end is connected with the second coming of Jesus Christ and writing to the church of God that Paul persecuted, that they are confirmed unto the end is associated with the second coming of Jesus Christ. That, verse 8, is not the rapture of the church. Especially, and I'm going to say this again, especially if you claim to be, now I know some people are claiming to be King James Bible believers, they're claiming it, but I'm beginning to doubt it. I'm beginning to doubt it. God had a language that he spoke to Israel and it was about works and it was about judgment. And he spoke that very clearly to them from Genesis all the way to even in these transition epistles as we're coming into the age of grace. This is why it's necessary to even rightly divide Paul's epistles. 
Let me share with you another doctrine that we find here. We know that the Hebrew epistles, Saul of Tarsus was saved after the fall of Israel, Acts chapter 7. God gave him Romans to Philemon. In the very beginning, Paul realizes that he's going to be going to the Gentiles all by himself. Ah, no. These people who fell, this little flock, they hadn't done anything wrong. They had believed that Jesus Christ was their Messiah. They believed it. It was the leaders of Israel who rejected Jesus Christ, not the little flock. But because of the leaders, their program was all cut off. They weren't able to go to their neighbors anymore and say, believe on Jesus Christ, he's the Messiah of Israel. That wasn't the message anymore. And Paul, when he met them at Antioch, they had their first huddle. Those Gentiles over there, we're going to go tell them God has a gift for them. That's how the gospel came to the Gentile world, through a bunch of Jews who knew the scripture, who knew God. God sir, couldn't use Gentiles to do it. What did a stupid Gentile know about God? But anyway, and then the, one day the church is going to be caught out of here, then Hebrews to Revelation are the epistles written to that group of people in the little flock. We read in 1 John chapter 1, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Going through the tribulation is not going to be easy. Jesus Christ told his disciples in John 16, 24, Hitherto, until now, Ye have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. He's talking about in the tribulation period. Obviously today, if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. You didn't wake up this morning with manna in your yard, did you? Yeah. What if you had asked for manna? Would you have got, woke up with manna in your yard this morning? No, but they're going to ask and they're going to receive that their joy may be full in the tribulation period. But I want you to see that fellowshipping with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, will be important in the, in the tribulation period. That's why Jesus Christ told His disciples in Matthew 18, Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth, as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. That's fellowship with the Son. You see that? That's fellowship with the Son. So he continues in 1 John. Notice verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him. And declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So what this means is fellowship with the Father and with the Son is conditional. It's based on not walking in darkness. It's based on walking in the truth. But if they walk in darkness, they lie. Notice verse 7. But if, if we walk in the light as he is in the light. Ah, ah. There's the requirement. You're in Christ, okay? That's not a requirement on you. You're not always going to be truthful. You haven't always told the truth in your life. Even as a saved person, you haven't always told the truth. So, but your, but your relationship with God is not based on an if. There is no condition. You are forgiven. You have the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to your account. But if we walk in the light 
as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. If, if, if. If is a big word. If. Two letters that change Israel's program to our unconditional relationship in the body of Christ. If. One little word. If ye walk. If we walk, he said to these people going through the tribulation period. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Does the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse you from all sin? Or have you been cleansed of all sin? You have been cleansed of all sin. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stain. There is a fountain of blood that continually flows over you like Niagara Falls. You are forgiven in Christ. That's what it means to be in Christ. It means you are forgiven. You'll never be perfect. I always talk about halos. <laughs> You'll never be perfect. You'll never have a halo. But these people, they have a conditional fellowship with Jesus Christ. It's not the same as forgiveness that's provided for the body of Christ. Now, can you see that the little flock fellowship with Jesus Christ, where two or three are gathered together in His name, there am I in the midst, if you walk in the light. Can you see that? That's, fellow, that that's little flock doctrine. Can you see that? Here's the thing. If you believe this, if you believe what, what we just said, which is the scripture, I can tell you I wholeheartedly believe it. With all my heart, I know the difference between the, flock, the little flock and the body of Christ. I know the difference between the language that belongs to the little flock and I know the language that belongs to the body of Christ. You can only be a helper of somebody's joy if you understand those distinctions. That's the only way you can be a helper of somebody's joy today. If you don't understand those distinctions, you can't be a helper of somebody's joy. You're going to be a preacher of fear. But if you believe this, you're not going to have any trouble understanding that in the transition period when God used the little flock to help Paul reach to the Gentile world, Paul, when Paul says, who shall confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? Now, I don't know if you understand this or not, but because the righteousness of Jesus Christ has been imputed to your account, you are blameless. You are blameless. That's what enables you to go to heaven. That's what enables you to go to heaven because you are blameless because as a Gentile, you really did receive a free gift. I mean, you really, really did receive it. Had you not received it, if it was a partial gift that demanded some of your service to also be judged one day, you might not be too blameless. But here's people that they might be blameless. Okay? Remember him who had no sin? That we might be made the righteousness of Christ in him? No, we're the righteousness of Christ in God. Not people who are being confirmed to the end that we, that we may be blameless. That we may be, you might be blameless in the day, the second coming of Jesus Christ. Notice the next verse, to the church of God that Paul persecuted. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. Did we not just demonstrate what fellowship is for these people? It's conditional. It's written to people who will be confirmed to the end in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I will say this emphatically. If you believe, if you're the person who believes that God uses language intentionally, and that every word of God is pure, you will not have one struggle understanding 
that those who are called into the fellowship of his son are those we just read about in 1 John chapter 1, whose fellowship is conditional. And they may be, they may be blameless. If you believe your King James Bible, you won't have a problem with that at all. But I don't think everybody believes their King James Bible. I'm becoming more and more convinced of that as the days go on. Those of you who understand this, those of you who understand this, what I just showed you, what fellowship is. Paul never says to a member of the body of Christ, you've been called unto his fellowship. You are his body. You are in him. Those of you who understand this will say, wow, that both theirs and ours, wow, that really makes sense. Both theirs and ours. I'm going to close with this today. For by, if by one man's offense death reigned, by one. We don't have to guess who that is, right? That's Adam. Death came by Adam. Sin came by Adam, and what happened? Death reigned. Death was king over all of Adam's children, and it still is. Death reigned. Much more, they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. What reigns in life? What reigns in this life today? Abundance of grace and righteousness. That's the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Those two things, grace and his righteousness, the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, those two things reign supreme in our lives in those of us who are in Christ. That's what's king over all our lives right now. Verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. The judgment is death. Death is the condemnation of the reign of, of sin and death in this world. But notice the contrast. For those of us who are in Christ, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. You cannot help but notice that with this free gift, there is no judgment. There's no judgment with this free gift. There's free gift with the reign of sin and the reign of death, but there's no judgment with the free gift. Not now and not there. There's no judgment for you. Then Paul finishes Romans 5 with these verses, and I'm just going to read them without even making a comment. Just listen. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Well, by the, by, by the law is the knowledge of sin. That's what that just said. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. When grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life, there are no strings attached. Grace is a word that stands alone in the English vocabulary. Grace is God's word. Grace is a word that can only come from Almighty God Himself. Only God can have pure grace. Grace cannot be added to. 
Grace cannot be taken away from. It stands apart from every concept in all of God's creation. Grace is the foundation upon which you stand. It's the foundation upon which the relationship you have with God is based. It's established upon grace. To add something to grace is to blemish it and to disgrace it and remove its pure luster and beauty and glory. To say that someone is saved by grace and in the next sentence say, but your service, your works will be tried by fire is the most, the greatest contradiction in terms that I've ever heard in my entire life. I'm closing with this. We all came from churches that added something to make our salvation complete. There was always something else. You need to be dunked in water in obedience to the Lord's command. Oh, it's a command now. Not going to do anything for your salvation. It's not about your salvation. But you got to do it in obedience to the Lord's command. If you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. If you're not baptized in the name of Jesus, or if you're not baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or if you're, not, if you're baptized in a, in a tub, you know, you got to do it in a river, you got to do it in a stream, you got to do it outside in pure water. We all came out of something like that. And then, just when you think that you've left all that, and you found the Word of God rightly divided, and so many things fall into place. And the confusion leaves you all. Oh, Peter's writing to those people going in the tribulation period. Wow! I'm not like a dog returning to his vomit. I'm not like a pig wallowing in the mire. He that, he that sinneth willfully after he receives the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for him but a certain fearful look of judgment. Oh, wow! I now understand. They weren't writing to me. And just when you think you finally understand who you are in Christ and the peace of God is just overflowing and it's filling your heart and then you find out that the last frontier of works is in the minds of grace preachers and grace believers who did not rightly divide the epistles of Paul, and they took what belonged to Israel and they put it on the body of Christ to very people, the very people who should know that there is no room for works, any works, not even the works of your service to God. I personally believe and I am convinced that Satan found a way to eke out the last drop of works into the very people who should have known better from the very beginning. You have been duped into believing that this old, dirty, rotting, sinful, carnal body, this flesh in which dwells no good thing was somehow going to render a service to God that you could give him and receive gold, silver, precious stones and get rewards for what you did in this nasty piece of crap flesh that you live in. Sorry for that word. You've been duped. You've been duped. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life. 
through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's who you are in Christ. Not some little flocker who's got works that are following him to the judgment seat of Christ at the end of the tribulation period. As is so clearly shown in the word of God, so clearly shown in the word of God that that's who it's for. Here's what I know for sure. In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. That's what I know I have. That's what I know every single person who has believed the gospel of their salvation, I know that's what you have. Those of you who want to live, who want to lie to yourself and say, well, the judgment seat of Christ is just a nice place to go. It's not, not bad. No, we're just going there to, yeah. You're lying because the Bible teaches it completely different than that. It is not a happy place. And I'm thankful that I'm not going. And I'm thankful that there are a lot of people now who understand also that they're not going. And I'm going to pray for those of you who think you are because you are misguided. You are the misguided children of the dispensation of grace. And I will pray for you. But I promise you, that doctrine will never be spoken of in this pulpit, ever, 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 ever. Because it's not yours. You can buy it if you want, but you bought a lie. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I'm so thankful that your language is not as confused as many of us in this so-called grace movement. I'm thankful, Lord, that every word of God is pure and that we can rely upon it and we can understand the language that you have given us, a language of grace and peace and love and forgiveness. I thank you, Lord, that we can know that if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. I pray, Father, if anybody does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they will bow their heart and they will acknowledge their, their guilt, as Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And they will believe that Jesus Christ died, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And by simple faith in the finished work of that cross, God will save you. And God will give you the free gift of eternal life and will expect nothing from you in return. I pray these things in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Folks online, thank you for being with us today. And uh, remember, you're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Amen. Hopefully we'll see you Thursday night. I can't promise, but we'll see.